I've seen things. A few things before. Left the sun at Mumbai. Galaxies waiting to be found. Planets rich in resources. Battles to be fought. Treasures unknown. The universe you wouldn't believe. Space, the final frontier, and I'm finally trying Starfield. Even though it wasn't up for anything at the Game Awards and my baby, Baldur's Gate 3 was crowned. And the game of the year is Baldur's Gate 3. <laughs> Look at little Goblin Jr. No cry. I've played for about six hours now and Ugh. Nah, I'm sorry. I just can't stop thinking about No Man's Sky. No disrespect to Starfield, Bethesda has been working on this game forever. But everything that Starfield has built was on the ashes and charred remains of No Man's. If I could say that No Man's Sky has had a more difficult road than Fallout 76... Gonna give these things a, a good ride. By the way, go watch that video. It's my first gaming video. I mean no hyperbole. This game was hyped to the literal stars and back, an infinite cosmos to traverse, battle in large fleets of starships, and catalog the wonders of the universe. Sounded incredible. It sounded like a dream. It was too good to be true. And you'd be correct. Now, let's go back to a simpler time, a better time. 2013. Meet Sean Murray, founder and CEO of Hello Games. Sean would make the framework that would be No Man's Sky's procedurally generated planets. And in my spare time, I started working on this thing, this mad, this mad project. We called it Skyscraper at the time, and it's what basically became No Man's Sky. With a promising start and a passion filling Sean's heart, he'd quadruple his team size. That's right, he's now got four people. We were this tiny team. The average size of Hello Games was about six people when we were making No Man's Sky, whereas, you know, most game teams are 400, 600 people, that kind of thing, making AAA games. That's right, also including himself. So, uh, yeah. In the months that followed, Murray would have a team of about 10 to 12 people on No Man's Sky helping him develop, which, for perspective, the scope and size, Subnautica, another small indie-ish kind of game around the same time, had 50 people developing it. No Man's Sky had a fraction of that and an infinite time scope after the marketing push. At the VGX Awards, No Man's Sky was the showstopper two years in a row and quickly became one of the biggest talking points in video games during that time. But as the years go on, Sean would commit the biggest cardinal sin in game development, overpromising, also known as feature creep, constantly promising new features 
features and mechanics that take the developers away from the core mechanics causes a game to have no defining traits or identity. With more features being promised and hype exceeding the wildest dreams, Hello Games had to make a choice. Release the game in the incomplete state that it was in, or delay it and give them some time to work on these promises. Sean went with the latter, and the gaming community was not very happy. Now personally, I don't care if a game is delayed. Got all the time in the world with the schlock that spit out every year. So I can wait for a game that I actually want to play. I think of that Miyamoto quote, a delayed game is eventually good, but a rushed game is Battlefield 2042 and nobody wants to be Battlefield 2042. So the game is delayed, only for a few months. But more concern loomed when the reviews and game journalists didn't receive copies of the game. Companies will send review copies to before you buy reviews and stuff like that. So game journalists can actually review and they put embargoes in place so that these reviewers can't show footage or certain things that the developers don't want you to see. But no copies were sent out, and no embargoes were put into place. Uh, that's, that's not good. What's even worse, somehow a leaked copy of the game was placed onto eBay two weeks before launch of the game. How this was done, I don't know, but I don't think it's gonna work for you, bud. With all that, the game launches, and oh boy, it sucked. No Man's Sky? More like, no guy by. <laughs> <laughs> what makes this game worth trying out, even through the devastating realization that most of the crafting, combat, and other activities you do on and between those planets ranges between bemusing and outright bad. With No Man's Sky, I was expecting that next big leap, except it fucking leaped backwards. After the wow factor wears off and you dive into the meat of the gameplay, it becomes apparent that this is one seriously flawed game right now. But as you sink your teeth into the game, you realize it's a lot of flesh and barely any substance. Can I teleport back to my ship? No. Can you collect plants in this game? No. Will you be able to play with your friends? No. Most of the promises made by Sean and the team were not implemented whatsoever. Planets and creatures were just not working. Game modes promised that were just not there. And the gameplay was more simple than Cookie Clicker. Oh, that's dated. And with a lack of embargoes, people were eating the game alive. Not just the game though, Hello Games were in the trenches as well. Review sites were bombed, their offices threatened by bombs, death threats to the dev team, won over butterflies. What the fuck? No Man's Sky was a complete failure. But what did Hello Games do? in the coming months. Write a marketing apology and promise to improve the game with delayed updates and microtransactions? Nope, they stayed silent and went hard to work to try and make the game that they promised. Instead of making excuses, they went to work. Over time, people started to calm down about the bad state of the game, giving it more leeway, calling it relaxing, yet boring. Now, Hello Games can work with that. As the months went on, Hello Games got to work stabilizing the game that they had, accumulating in the 1.0 update foundation. This was a better version of the game, but they weren't done. Months turned to years, and the updates haven't stopped. And I want you to know where No Man's Sky is today. Do you see the love that is still put into this game when it's well past its prime? But could it still hold a candle in 2024? So I hopped on for a few hours to see what kind of things No Man's Sky can wow me with. First booting up the game, we have a multitude of game modes, including the Expedition tab to put you straight into this season's big quest. But we're not gonna do that. We're going into a normal character. Seeing the stars and planets fly by as you wait in the loading screen is, it's, it's gorgeous, but I can also see how it's getting disorienting. Uh, hang on, hang on a second. <laughs> wow, this place sucks, but it has a ring. Wow, still bugs, huh? I start to harvest some supplies to fix my scanner. The grind for better gear is apparent for how slow everything is and how restrictive the mining can be. Scanning for harvestable materials is shown by the scanner, like oxygen and sodium, which are used in a variety of things like health regeneration and battery rechargeability. I got the location of my apparent spacecraft and headed towards it, watching the planet around me, the various dangerous plants, creatures with unique looks and spacecraft flying overhead. Even though I feel like I'm in Arizona, it's beautiful out here at night. I find the ship in rough shape needing many repairs. I grabbed the strange beacon in the pot and sent it out, then disappeared. Strange. I checked the flight log and the ship recognizes me as its captain. 
The pulse engines and thrusters are busted, so we need to get to work. Grinding, yay. Now, I know you can play this game in creative mode, where you don't have to worry about all these little things and repairing shit. But I'm a tedious motherfucker. I like doing this kind of stuff. Hard work pays off. If I'm playing with a bunch of friends, sure. By all means, we gotta be in creative mode. But yeah, I, I, I like feeling accomplished. After building myself a planetary scanner in my helmet, I was able to fix the pulse engine. However, I needed to refine some ferrite to fix the thrusters. So now we're introduced to refining. Essentially, it's a cobblestone forge. There you go. And now the final piece is fixed and we have takeoff. After leaving the planet's atmosphere, I received an incoming message. Shit, okay. I'm just gonna... I'm gonna go scan some planets if you don't mind. Send me to a planet in the same system where I received this message. A cosmic storm rolled through this asteroid belt I was mining through and... Damn! Damn! This game is stunning when it wants to be. Mining and asteroid belts give you a useful material for your spacecraft, for building and refueling. I headed to the planet, flying through space like Han Poyo and chewing tobacco. Landing on this corrosive green planet, I find less foliage, but way more creatures here. Showing the planetary diversity for each planet you visit. Some will be a walking paradise with no effects or damages to you at all, while others will be wholly unique like only having mushrooms or bubbles or slabs of metal being the only thing you see for miles. Decoding the messages leaves us with... I start the search to build a base, which is a lot harder than it looks actually. You need to find deposits of certain materials to mine to break them down into a refinery to make them useful metals. It's a long process. I haven't automized it yet in my main save, but hey, still sucks. Luckily, your scanner can tell you what deposits are in your area, so it's not like a wild goose chase or anything. Oh shit, yo, what's up, big chungus? After scrounging some chromatic metal, I was able to build a base computer. Will I ever really use this base? Probably not. But a tutorial is a tutorial, and now I have a teleporter. After building my base, the computer will tell me I have a new message from the space center. All right, punch it, Chewie. Entering the space station gives us a rock anthem Van Halen would be proud of. The space station will be your one-stop shop for supplies, upgrades, new ships, and new companions. The space station will also show many new races and travelers you'll meet through your cosmic journey. The trading class Gex, the barbaric and conquering Vlakeen, and the techno-savvy mechs known as the Korvac. Talking with them can increase your standings with each race, as well as learn their unique language. Asking around the space station, I get wary looks and weary eyes as I mention the numbers. One, however, seems to get possessed while talking to me, saying find what they left for me, and they're watching. Okay, cool, thanks, mind control Fiona. After pimping myself out with some new digs, yeah, I'm 28. I've traveled back to my base. As long as you have a teleporter there, you can return to the space station at any time. My base computer gives me a new location to explore according to the numbers, so I make haste immediately. No barrel roll! Whoa. <laughs> Genuinely, whoa. Crash freighters can litter any planet, leaving behind valuable materials and upgraded technology. And this one left me a blueprint for a hyperdrive. Oh shit, let's do this. Get me out of this fucking system. Granted, I haven't tried to explore this system due to low resources, which seems to be an issue in certain systems I've noticed. Back at the space station, I bought some microprocessors and all the chromatic metal I could carry so I could get this hyperdrive up and running ASAP. With the hyperdrive functional now, it just needs fuel. Just need to hop to the next planet over and grab some antimatter. What, what antimatter? Antimatter? Are you fucking serious? Oh my god, this was. This was in my system? This was in my system? This place is so damn unique. Fractured rectangles and prisms scatter the landscape, and you can just take them. <laughs> I love this place. Maybe I don't need to leave quite so soon. Checking out the research base will show it's abandoned and an infection runs over the entire facility. After cleaning the controls, it'll give me a blueprint for antimatter, as well as watch me with an unbreaking crimson. crimson. 
heading back into space, I saw the planet next to me hadn't been explored yet, and I thought, what the hell, might as well check it out. Oh, hell yeah! A paradise planet in my system too? Bet. Let's go. Paradise planets are the most sought after planets in every system due to there being no oxygen depletion and no planetary effects. These planets are the best for personal base building in my opinion, even if some like this one seem relatively boring. <laughs> God, I love this game. After exploring the planet and gathering some materials, I grabbed something I wasn't supposed to grab. And now we're introduced to Sentinels. Robots that guard certain planets of their resources. They will attack anything that seems like a threat to the planet, and that means my grubby little mitts are a threat to the planet. All right, maybe this place isn't a paradise. All right, let's go. Man, this game still has bugs. Yo, what the shit? Is that boulder moving? Back on my base planet, I begin to collect the materials I need to craft antimatter. I don't know if I mentioned it, but antimatter is the resource to get you to different solar systems. Without it, you're stuck in your current system. Got the components together, fueled up my hyperdrive, and opened my galactic map. Every single one of the stars is a solar system, with its own planets, species, economies, and people to interact with, trade with, work, or even oversee as their oversee. And we're off. What a transition. And with no loading screen, nonetheless. I get another mysterious transmission from somewhere, showing me a fuel source on one of the planets. And with my luck, it's a paradise planet. Hopefully it's better in the eyes than the last one. Oh, this place has been impacted by so many meteors, the craters are everywhere. But I do like it here. Reminds me of a pseudo-Earth. Ooh, eerie. The small stone pillars give knowledge on certain languages depending on the planet and system you're in. I set a base computer here, explored my new home, and made my way back to the stars. I'm offered to trade with another roaming voyager, and these small interactions between travelers are always something I loved in games, making the world, or universe in that matter, seem alive. Ah uh, yes, chair, chair. I get another transition in space, this one seeming full of fear and spite towards me. I needed to find out who this person is, and maybe I can find out who I am. Landing back on my paradise planet, I'm able to find the source of the transmission, a downed spaceship. Repairing the space beacon, I'm given a name, Artemis. The only thing from the transmission that was salvageable. Most likely the owner of the ship. Oh, sorry, my ship. Shipwrecks will be scattered from time to time on random planets so you can claim them, fix them up, and keep them for yourself. Or sell them for a hefty profit. Or trade them with other players or NPCs for their ships. Whoa! After fixing the ship to at least working repair, it was time to test it out. God, I love this game. Oh, 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 fuck. The anomaly is the multiplayer hub for No Man's Sky, and this is where you'll meet new players and your friends to take on missions and explore each other's universes. It's full of collectibles, upgrades, and rewards for those willing to put in the work. I speak with Nada, the overseer of the anomaly, and she gives me advice on my mission, find myself amongst the stars. This game has impressed me so much, and it's been two and a half hours. This is me following just the main quest line, and not doing too much exploring, and man, I have barely scratched the surface on what this game has to offer, and it's not even close to being done yet. I mean, with their new game Light No Fire announced, I just wanted to revisit this game and see if it was deserving the banishment of unfulfilled games, but no. No Man's Sky is the story of overcoming adversity to deliver on the promises made, and to go infinity and beyond.